want to talk about how to, how to think about a circuit that you might be handed and how do you build a one-port model out of this. I kind of want to walk through a particular example. And we're going to walk through this particular circuit right here and see what that would look like. Now, one of the ways you can often get to a one-port approach is by being able to do a whole bunch of systematic reductions. And if you can do that, say, to have an Norton kind of transformations, parallel series combinations, you can kind of get there. And remember that the one-port approach is that if I have resistors and dependent and independent sources, that can always be represented as either a Thevenin equivalent, which is going to be a voltage source, and a resistor, both of which are going to, I'll have a, which will have an effective voltage and an effective resistance. Or it could be a Norton form of it, which then has its own effective current and effective resistance. So, great. So normally you'd say, great, I should go ahead and be able to, to just drive that. Unfortunately, if I give you a circuit that looks something like this one, there's not a lot of really good obvious Seven and Norton kinds of reductions or other parallel series reductions that naturally work. And part of it is because I have this wonderful um, voltage control current source in the middle. And that's dependent on the voltage that's between these two resistors. And you say, well, okay, now what am I going to do with this? For those of you who've had some more advanced circuits, one of the things you'll notice is that this has a feel towards looking at having resistive feedback around a transconductance amplifier or an op-amp type structure. And so it has that kind of feel to it. And so the, the circuit itself is, has um, some very important and typical practical applications. Unfortunately, not a trivial way forward in the problem. Okay, so how to approach this? Well, I need to do two things. I need to eventually figure out what is my effective resistance and what is my effective voltage for those two components of a Thevenin system. I'm going to go with the Thevenin equivalent in this case. All right. Here's my circuit. Here are the parameters. We'll try to be analytic as much as we can and then start putting in numbers as we start pushing forward a little further in. So to get the effective voltage, that I would have, it would basically be the same thing as if I took this circuit and basically left this be open circuited such that I could just measure the output voltage. That kind of gets me where I want to go with this. Uh, because if I think about it, there's going to be a certain offset that's going to be related to that equivalent structure, and that's pretty much going to be it. Um, the nice thing in this particular circuit is that there's no current going through these nodes because of the open circuit part. It also means there's no current going through R4. So I basically can almost act as, as if it's not there. And my effective voltage in that situation would just be V1. And so then you can kind of solve that. And you begin to set that problem up by saying, I can imagine KCL from, you know, basically across V2. So the current through this resistor has to equal to the current in that resistor. And the current in this resistor has to equal to these two remaining components. That gives me these, this equation underneath. I can then take this and realize, okay, it gives me two equations, this first one and second one. This first one coming from the first two parts, the second one coming from the last two parts. And if I actually take these and then take it, make it a little bit easier and actually plug in the values we would have over here, I end up finding out that because of R1 and R2 are equal, I get this VA plus V1 is 2V2. I also then plugging in the values here, realizing GM is the key term, is the GM and R3 are the dominant terms. This gives me something that's approximately 2V2, is then gives me V1. The net effect is my effective voltage V1 is effectively then going to be um, VA over 2. And in particular, if I look at this closely, I have to think also what would the sign of this um, particular solution look like? Hmm, that, that always makes this a little more interesting, right? You start to think, which way does that go? A little bit of an exercise for the reader or the, or the watcher, but you'll see this down in the description. So then the other thing, so I left the sign out for you intentionally. The other thing is, 
hmm, what happens when I look at the rest of this in terms of resistance? Well, the resistance is going to be then the effect of the output port when VA is basically going to be off. I'm turning off all the independent sources. And in this case, that would just sort of short that particular voltage source. Now, the issue with that is kind of interesting um, because I can get rid of this one. And you think, oh, great, I can get rid of. No, no, I don't get to get rid of the dependent sources, just the independent ones. Oh, oh, well. OK, we can still continue. And that by doing that, that means this resistor is then shorted to the second terminal. I can rotate R1 down. That means it's going to have V2 across it, and we should be in good shape. So then I look at this circuit, and I think, OK, now how am I going to approach it? Well, uh, certainly the R4, the R3 makes sense. But then I get this whole nugget of a circuit. And this is a really interesting kind of piece of a circuit because basically from V1 to V2, I have a resistive voltage divider. OK. So that means that V2 is going to be some fraction of V1 determined by R1 over the sum of R1 plus R2. No problem. So then I just can kind of substitute that in. And now everything is a function of V1. But here's the funny thing. This particular element is a current that's proportional to V1 as a voltage control current source. We know what this is. This is effectively a resistance. And I can then rewrite and redraw it this way. When I see the circuit this way, I see that I have three things in parallel, uh, R1 and R, R1 plus R2, which turns out to be a pretty large number in this case. That's about 40k. And so it turns out to be negligible compared to the other two, which are both about 1 kilo ohm each. And so the net result is I get an effective resistance of about 1.5 kilo ohms. So one can go through and actually solve this kind of a circuit and, and it just takes a little bit of patience and then if you do that you can actually get this this what complicated looking structure into just a single voltage source and a single output resistance.